So as I've said, John is a professor at the University of Portsmouth. Uh, he's a professor of structural biology focused on the global challenges of plastic pollution and leads a team of scientists researching natural enzyme discovery and engineering. He founded the Center for Enzyme Innovation in 2019, where he's currently the director. John graduated from the University of Glasgow in 1993 with a BSc in a degree in microbiology before going on to complete a PhD in virology at the MRC Virology Unit in Glasgow. His research career continued at the University of York before joining the University of uh, Portsmouth in 2000, where he was working on DNA binding proteins. In, 20, in 2005, he completed a postdoctoral fellow with EMBL Grenoble in France, researching crystallography uh, at the large European synchrotron in Grenoble. In 2007, he re rejoined the University of Portsmouth as an uh, RCUK fellow and was appointed to reader in 2012 and professor in 2016. Okay, John, the floor is yours. Uh, perfect. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the introduction, Gary. Um, what's, uh, what's really nice to see in this lineup of speakers is that there is a, a quite a strong theme of microbiology. And of course, I, I'm now a structural biologist, uh, but uh, my original love was always microbiology. And that's something that's very much been a, a theme in, in my career. And uh, what I hope I can do today is take you through some of the, the things that we're working on in the Centre for Enzyme Innovation at Portsmouth. Um, that actually link to, to the hub. There's, there's quite a few strong parallels there. Um, and uh, I think this is really nice, actually, because um, the hub is taking things in, in quite a different direction that we're going, but there's lots of synergy, potentially, I think, um, and also from other members that, that Gary spoke about earlier. So, so thanks once again for the invitation to speak here. Um, I kind of want to start off quite broad, actually, because uh, um, I've been working on polymers for my whole career. Um, I started off uh, with this polymer here, DNA, and we were working on enzymes that could cleave um, DNA uh, very specifically at very specific sites, restriction enzymes. And we kind of started moving from there um, to other sort of enzyme families. Uh, the next one would be cellulose and then more recently lignin. And what's really interesting about all these polymers is that in nature, they are infinitely recycled. Uh, nature's got this incredible ability to, to reuse. Um, and we see this in, in across the world in these very large systems uh, where a carbon is recycled uh, over and over again. And uh, when it comes to um, environmental problems of today, when we think about po polymers that are polluting our environment, um, synthetic polymers here, um, you know, we can have a huge amount of learning from this space. You know, people have been working in this space for many decades. Um, and there's a lot of mature technologies and thinking in this area. And I think there's real massive opportunities for translation into this space here. And actually, you know, wh when you look at this, if you look at the complexity of some of these molecules like lignin, when you start to think about, well, if we can break those down, you know, how easy should it be to break these down? They look pretty simple. Unfortunately, of course, this is not, not proved to be the case. And uh, some of these polymers are, are pretty intractable, particularly when you've got these carbon-carbon bonds. Um, the, these are very um, high energy bonds that are difficult to break, but we're, we're searching the environment for things that may be able to do that. So, you know, we work on a whole number of, of different polymers uh, from health to the environment. For example, my colleague, Dr. Andy Pickford works in collagen, and this is one of the most um, abundant proteins in the human body. And of course, to grow, we need to make it and break it um, all the time. And we see in disease type states where um, tumors are breaking through into um, invasive areas that they use enzymes called MMPs that are not natural enzymes, but they upregulate them so that that invasion can take place. And this is one of those kind of polymer activities, breakdown activities that's happening um, all the time in our bodies. I mentioned bacterial DNA and the ability to use restriction enzymes, and uh, this is very important in uh, antibiotic resistance and lots of different areas in microbiology. Um, this is one of the enzymes we solved uh, a while back. Um, this is a cellulase. In fact, uh, we're very interested in enzymes that can break down lignocellulosic material. This is a, a very well-used slide um, from Bidlack um, from 93 that kind of shows the complexity of lignocellulose. 
uh, we have this uh, sugary chains that are all lined up in this crystal environment. Then you've got this hemicellulose, and then you've got this lignin that's attaching there, which is protecting um, that, that cellulose from being digested. So breaking this down is a, is a complicated business requiring multiple types of enzyme families. And that's what we've been working on for some time. Um, this is uh, one of the enzymes that we kind of started off with. Um, and this is kind of the first one I would say where we're actually doing what we're continuing to do now, and that is to look to nature for, for inspiration. And uh, this has been incredibly productive, actually. So, so this little organism here is a gribble. Um, it's, it's a centimeter long. And uh, these ones were, were cultured from the end of South Sea Pier down here in Portsmouth. And you'll find them all, over, all around the UK, um, munching away at wood. And uh, these, these organisms have this incredible ability to live on a diet of lignocellulose. So we were very interested in this. And, and my colleague, Professor Simon Cragg, who's a marine zoologist and electron microscopist, um, we had one of those meetings, I have to say it was in the pub, one of those uh, very productive meetings over beer, where I said, I'm working in this organism. And it's really strange because unlike termites, when we look into its gut, um, it's sterile yet it produces, clearly must produce enzymes to break down lignocellulose to produce sugars and other molecules to, to function. Um, and of course I said, yeah, this sounds amazing actually. Termite guts are, are a hard, you know, the people that do this are amazing because termite guts have this incredible series of microbial communities all the way through the gut that help to produce enzymes to break down this recalcitrant material. But uh, these gribbles can do it by themselves. Um, so they're actually producing the enzymes from their own genome. And this creates a really nice test system. So this is one of the enzymes. Uh, it's a GH7 uh, cellobiohydrolase. And it's really interesting. It's got this incredible, uh, incredibly strong acidic coat here. And uh, so that, that makes it um, uh, very resistant to salt. In fact, you can have this enzyme working at five molar salt. You can't get more salt in there really. And it, it turns away quite happily. In fact, it works better in high salt conditions. Of course, seawater is very far from five molar. So why, why it's so extreme, we're not quite sure. But the idea here was one of those grand plans that I, I had where um, <laughs> we got the group together and said, okay, let's clone every single enzyme that is secreted from this organism. Then we'll, we'll make them all. Um, synthetically, we'll put them all in a bioreactor and then we'll be able to have this tuned bioreactor. What's amazing about these organisms, you feed them different wood and they give a different enzyme cocktail, uh, which I think is really incredible. So there's some sensing going on there and, and I think that we could learn an awful lot from that. Problem is, <laughs> they're a night nightmare to make. So in fact, we tried every single expression system under the sun, even plants and, and xenopus frogs and everything, you know, to try and get these to express. Eventually we, we called on our friends um, at Novozymes in Denmark, who've got some really fancy fungal strains that seem to work. And they were able to produce um, this protein for us and we were able to crystallize it and get the structure. But that's the only one. <laughs> so so we, our, our grand idea is a thing of a bioreactor that could do this. Uh, we're scuppered by the fact that they're really difficult to make. So again, I think we, I'd like to revisit this at some point, um, maybe with some of the modern in silico technologies that might help, help us find out the rules of protein folding for these marine proteins and, and, and see what we can do there. Um, we, we've, we're still working on lignin um, and lignin, you know, there's this famous quote, you can make anything from lignin except money. I think that's now changed quite a lot, actually. The, the, the um, metabolic engineering people have really crushed this um, in terms of, of, of publications over the past few years. It's amazing what's coming out. And, you know, this is an incredible molecule. You know, it's, it's very heterogeneous, but look at all those aromatic carbons in there. Um, currently is burned um, as, a, as a byproduct of uh, biomass uh, for cellulosic ethanol production. And uh, actually it's worth far, far more than the energy that you can get from incineration. But it's pretty difficult, um, you know, because when you deconstruct lignin by maybe steam explosion or alkali or acid treatment, depending what type of lignin you've got and, and all the different uh, associated um, other bits that you find in there, 
um, you deconstruct it into this big mess of molecules. Um, and actually what you really want at the end of the day is a nice pure um, molecule. And I think we'll hear more about that later this afternoon. So I'm looking forward to hearing some of those talks, people who are actually able to do this because it's very, very difficult. Um, we are interested in it because um, as you know, from a biochemical and enzymatic point of view, there's, there's certain enzymes that we found were real bottlenecks in the process from this kind of fancy diagram of turning this heterogeneous mo molecule into 747. This is, <laughs> this is pretty difficult, let's, let's be fair here, and we've got a long way to, do, to go. Um, what we noticed is that you know, enzymes that um, are involved in, in the this of removing the decorations on these aromatics that are produced from the initial pretreatment are really important. So you need to, for example, remove this O-methyl group here, um, converting guaiacol to catechol. So guaiacol is that molecule, the kind of amandy smoky type, uh, type um, uh, flavor and, and taste. And um, you need to do this for the downstream enzymes, the sort of ring cleaving enzymes, before you can then get to kind of valuable products like adipic acid, which is a precursor of nylon, for example. So we were quite interested in these bottleneck enzymes to see if we could kind of engineer them out. Um, the, the, the major principle here is that we take these lignin monomers, be it G or S or, or the other uh, lignin monomers, into the upper pathways of the bacterial metabolism, push them forward. In this case, we're concentrating in the OD methylation. Then we get them to these central intermediates where you can either have an intra or intra inter or intradiol cleavage of these, which then you can get them into central metabolism and make whatever you want. So we were looking at one enzyme that we found in a Cetinobacter species, which um, could do this reaction here. Um, uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see guaiacol here. And as I mentioned, what the, the challenge here is to move this O-methyl group here. Um, and what this enzyme does is it breaks that bond and you end up with uh, catechol and formaldehyde as an as a exit product. Um, if we go all the way back to here, this is it's a two enzyme system and we start with NADH in this case, this is where the electrons come from and it goes through this uh, cofactor FADH, uh, a two iron sulfur cluster here um, and this is the reductase part of the, the system, it then goes into the heme where that turns over and cycles round in order to produce the electrons for breaking uh, this uh, O-methyl uh, group. So um, we got into the lab and we started uh, make cloning these things. And this is, I'm using this as just one example of the many enzymes that we work on. Um, I'm using this one as an example because this one worked. Um, you know, I think uh, sometimes you have these grand plans and some of these um, enzymes are actually quite uh, um, intractable to, to make, particularly in E. coli, as, as Gary mentioned. So I'm looking forward to hearing about the other expression system too. Um, so we made this nice protein. This was the, the GCOA, this is the P450 component. And then we made the, the GCOB, this is reductase component. And you can see uh, eight, the absorbance at 260 here is due to either the heme here or the cofactor FAD here. And the nice thing about this, because you know you get very sick in biochemistry of lovely clear solutions. These are actually colored, which is lovely. So GCOA is, is a bit brown due to the heme and GCOB has got this cofactor FAD, which is a nice yellow color. It also makes it annoyingly light sensitive. So you have to do everything in the dark. But apart from that, um, yes, it's actually quite a nice enzyme system to work on. So as with all our systems, we tend to collaborate really widely and we work very closely with colleagues at um, Montana State University, Jen Dubois group, because they, they're experts in biochemistry of metal containing enzymes and, and they really helped us go through the, the EPR and the, the, the types of um, systems and techniques that really pull out the, the molecular details of these enzymes. And this is what we found. Uh, we found that this, um, when you try all these different, remember that the overall idea here is to have a system where you can take heterogeneous molecules and turn them into something pure and valuable. So we're looking to see how this enzyme uh, set performs against these different aromatic compounds. And you can see uh, in blue here is the amount of aldehyde produced. And here is the aromatic produced in pink. And in gray here, you've got the NAD that's consumed in that reaction. And from guaiacol, you can see this is working quite well. We're utilizing lots of NADH, um, but uh, we're also producing lots of product, which is super. 
However, if you go all the way to the right here and look at a molecule, which is syringol, and here you've got two um, uh, methyl groups here, so sort of one, one in each side here. Um, and what you can see here is you're losing, you're using a huge amount of NADP, uh, NADPH, but actually, or NADH, sorry, in this case, um, you're not producing any products and there's very little aldehyde being made. So this is an uncoupled reaction. Um, there's unproductive cycles of going around this without any cleavage happening. And we're quite interested to see, we, we knew P450s are, are pretty good targets for engineering. So we thought, okay, let's, let's have a bash at this and see how we go. So we solved the structure of this, and this is, this is really nice because we're able to see here the ligand very clearly. Um, these, these were super crystals that grew in cryo conditions and then were actually giant and very high resolution, which is pretty unusual. But this gave us a really nice system where we could try different ligands. Um, and we're able to look at how the, the ligand here, guaiacol, um, orientates itself uh, to the heme, um, and it's surrounded by these hydrophobic residues that create this kind of hydrophobic cavity in the middle of the P450. Um, and, you know, we did lots of experiments on this. We kind of went to town on it because it's such a nice system. And these are molecular dynamics simulations uh, without ligand and with ligand. And we can see that uh, the enzyme is the capability of closing and opening. So after the, the chemistry has taken place, uh, the enzyme opens, thus releasing the products here. And we're able to study that in quite some detail, which is really fun, actually. Um, not all systems behave this well. Um, we then looked at the reductase partner, and that was quite nice as well because it's got, uh, as I mentioned, uh, three domains, actually. This is the uh, NADH binding domain here. We've got the FAD binding domain here, and we've got this iron sulfur cluster. Now, we never managed to get crystals of the whole thing, but uh, we're able to kind of model this. So there's guaiacol sitting in the active site of the P415 orange. There's where we think the reductase is. And, and here's the different components here, the FAD, the two iron sulfur cluster, and the NAD um, binding site. So we could learn quite a lot about this, but really it's the, the P450 component in here that we thought we would try and do some engineering of. And this is, you know, you know, as I say, not everything always works out like this, but here's the active site. And what we're able to do is, is generate co-crystals with guaiacol and also with syringol. This is two methyl um, aromatic. And what you see is that although syringol binds into the active site, when we do this comparison, the syringol in pink here, you can see that the aromatic has shifted. Now, it doesn't look like a big shift, but actually that's enough to place the, the target uh, bond cleavage here of the O demethylation. Um, just far away enough from the heme to make it completely unproductive. If you remember, that's when we had these cycles of uh, NADH usage, but without any productive product formation. Now, when you look at this, you can see that actually in this pink structure here, this um, aromatic residue here is being pushed away. So there's clearly some steric hindrance going on due to this extra methyl group. So we thought, you know, simple, let's mutate it, make it a melanin and see what happens. And indeed, the syringol then binds productively in the active site. So that small change is enough to free up enough space and we get excellent turnover of syringol, which, which is great. Um, here it is it still works in guaiacol, but now it works really well in syringol too, which is great. Um, and actually surprisingly good <laughs> in some ways. Um, what we were then able to do is, uh, and that's just to show that guaiacol still binds even in the same position and is still productive even with that mutation. Um, we're able to pop this uh, mutant version or variant into Pseudomonas putida, our favorite industrial bacteria, and uh, we could show syringal turnover, which was really, really nice. So we thought, okay, great, Let, let's keep going with this. This, this is kind of working. So then we looked at, for example, aldehydes. Could we fit other stuff into this active site? So aldehydes, rather than um, uh, you know push against this aromatic, we, we could see there was some uh, nonsense going on with the, this heme here over, over in this, this um, lower portion of the active site. And we could see that the, these were very poorly positioned. Um, and actually, it's, it's a small change, but significant. And again, by simply changing um, 
Mr. Residue to serine. Um, we got productive binding, or you know, we get this um, much better uh, bond structure here, and the mobility is is um, much better for for the product release. And we could um, actually get this to turn over um, vanillin, which is really nice. That's that's another aromatic that's uh, potentially of high value. So you can sort to see how you can how you can do this. Okay, let me just check how I'm doing for time. We love iPhones with face recognition when we can't recognize your face. Okay, 20 minutes. Okay. So, um, so that's a lignin example. Um, and I guess uh, the overview here is that we're starting with a polymer that we're somehow depolymerizing by some pre-treatment or chemical or heat process. We're generating these mixtures of aromatics, but then we need to think about all the things to make this work. We need to then transport those aromatics into the bacterium and you know those transporters can be quite tricky sometimes um, we're doing that biological funneling with hopefully a heterogeneous mixture where we can have engineered enzymes that can accept multiple substrates um, that can do all these types of reactions that we need like od methylation i just showed hydroxylation decarboxylation uh, decarboxylation sorry um, and the idea here is we take those decorated aromatics and we simplify them so that they can be um, utilized by the ring opening enzymes and then be pushed down into the central intermediate. Um, and of course, the long term goal here is engineering towards a single product. We at the Center for Enzyme Innovation don't do that. We, we stop at the enzyme and pass it over to our colleagues at NREL, uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory in the US. Uh, Greg Beckham's group there is, is very focused on, on uh, designing pathways through metabolic engineering to produce um, high value products, um, much like we'll hear this afternoon, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, and I think this is a massive space for opportunity um, to, to you know, make these uh, value products essentially from waste material, in this case, biomass. But of course, you know, we're thinking there's other parallels here, particularly to other types of polymers. In my first slide, I mentioned synthetic plastics. Now, I don't know if you can hear this. I'll be quiet for a second in case you can. I don't think we can hear it, John. I certainly can't. Okay, so... Sorry. Um, that's okay. So you can look this up on YouTube. It's uh, The Graduate. If you type The Graduate Plastics, you'll come up with this little clip. And uh, what is being said here to Dustin Hoffman is the future is plastics. And of course, you know, this, this uh, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, we, we thought that the future was entirely plastics. Um, and of course, the, the answer is that it could be, but we did not think long term enough about how we would deal with the plastic waste that is produced from the huge industrial global production of these materials. Um, so, you know, coming back to this slide, um, we, we started with this uh, highly recalcitrant material lignin and, you know, we're breaking these bonds now. We're starting to produce really nice components from this that can be used. And I think this gives us hope when we then move to some components like this. So here we have PET and, uh, you know, polyester. And ester bonds are pretty cleavable by uh, natural enzymes. Here we've got um, PEF. This is the sugar-based polyester that was um, slated to take over from PET because it's got better barrier properties. It's made from sugars, um, but actually it turns out the mechanical properties aren't so great. Um, so people are still working on this. But then when we have these other common plastics like polyethylene and polypropylene, um, PVC, um, these are pretty tough for um, uh, enzymatic degradation. And that's simply because of the nature of the chemical bonds that are holding these long chains together. So this is something we're thinking quite hard about. Um, and to come back to, you know, something Gary mentioned about, you know, looking to the environment and how, you know, how can we, I guess, how, how can we more synergistic with the environment and learn from, from the processes that are happening? 
you know, I, I've called this a rubbish experiment. Sorry for the, the tongue in cheek, but you know, this is the worst possible experiment you can design. Like take 200 different types of common plastics and put them into every niche environment in the world, you know, be it the deep sea, you know, the polar caps, the air, um, you know, anywhere you can think of, you can find plastics. And then we have to try and unpick what kind of processes are going on there. You know, um, we're um, now working in Southeast Asia um, with my colleague Simon Cragg, who I mentioned before, um, looking at actually putting um, very defined and highly characterized plastics back into the environment under controlled conditions to see what types of um, breakdown are happening that we can measure in real time. We can start looking at the genomes involved there, uh, looking at the metagenomes of the microbial communities to see what we can unpick. Um, mangroves are a really interesting place, actually, if you think about environments, because you've got this huge carbon turnover and the, the, this mud um, uh, type of uh, scenario where, you know, you've got this huge amounts of leaf litter falling and then being turned over. As I mentioned, you know, nature is not wasting anything here. This, this is the place where you get to see infinite recycling. But unfortunately, mangrove roots uh, actually manage to act like huge sieves for plastic bags and, and other plastic waste. So you end up with these horrible scenarios where these environments are massively polluted by um, plastic waste. But uh, th this is um, a, a NERC grant that Simon got. And I think the title is, is quite nice because it's a hazard and a solution. We have a hazard here and we have a potential solution because in these root systems here in the leaf systems, we've got um, natural polyesters like cutin, or in the roots, roots we've got suberin, and there's massive, you know, oxic and anoxic and somewhere in between uh, bacterial communities that are really tackling these things. And I think that's a really exciting space because we forced all this plastic into the space. And now we're seeing, is there any crossover or evolution happening in real time that we can, we can actually use? Um, and of course, everyone knows about this study in, in 2016 from Yoshida et al, a, a group in Japan, um, who, who found this uh, plastic eating bacteria. So this, this made headline news. Um, this is Idianella sakaisiensis, named after the city it was found. And uh, the group were basically looking at the wastewater runoff in the soil, sampling underneath one of these giant, you know, um, uh, uh, recycling dumps for PET plastic. And, you know, as opposed to living off the sugar and organic material that was left in these, these drinks bottles, um, these bacteria were actually living off the plastic itself, which is, which is really interesting. And what they were able to do is take these back to the lab and culture them on plastic, uh, PET plastic films, and get them to be able to metabolize this. So they're actually using that plastic as both a carbon and an energy source, which is great. And the way they are doing that is producing two enzymes, a petase and an emhetase, which I'll come to in a second. So we got very interested in this. And because we we're doing a lot of structural biology with, with enzymes, we, we cloned and expressed the petase enzyme. And we got this lovely structure at the diamond light source, um, sub, sub angstrom resolution. Uh, these things crystallize really well. I mean, they're amazing to work with, actually. And they're rocks. They can sit on the bench after you purified them for months and they'll still be active, which is actually really good news if you're thinking about enzymes for, for recycling, um, because you want that kind of robustness. Um, and we were able to solve the 3D structure of this, which was great, um, along with three other groups in the same month. So that was a complete um, panic of, of publication. And we weren't the first, I think we were the third to get the structure out. But uh, what we did is we kind of held back a little bit and did a really detailed biochemical um, analysis, um, which actually helped our paper get picked up actually. So yeah, there's a, the charge for biochemistry there. Um, but of course, as a structural biologist, in fact, you don't need to be a structural biologist to see that the petase enzyme in blue here looks almost exactly the same as the cutinase. And as a structural biologist, this is a huge disappointment. I mean, we kind of knew this from the, the looking at the, the sequence um, homologies here, but uh, I was hoping for some magical new fold that, you know, uh, digested plastic. Um, of course, nature is, is never like that. It reuses stuff and just changes stuff slightly um, for its own purposes. And actually, this, this is the case here. You can see that the similarities between petase and cutinase is incredible. So we basically, we just put this structure into the database and the closest structure was this one here, the cutinase. So of course, we started to think quite hard about this. What, what is going on here? 
And if you think about what acutin is, does, it's produced by bacteria to allow them to, to break through this waxy natural polyester coating called cutin. So I mentioned that in the mangroves, you've got you know, all those leaves with this cutin layer. You've got all the roots with the suburin layer as well. So we're also looking in that direction too. Um, but these are, these are natural esterases that allow the bacteria to invade into those plant cells and get all that lovely juicy sugar um, from, from inside the leaves. And actually, when you look at the active site of um, acutinase, this particular closest match here, you can see where the, the chemistry takes place. Um, we've got a, a catalytic triad that sits down here, but you've got this uh, cleft here that allows the chains to, to um, be protected as the chemistry takes place. So, so this is the acutinase that digests natural polyesters. If you then compare this to the petase enzyme, what you can see is just a small couple of mutations, a couple of amino acid differences, massively open up this channel. And we think that may have something to do with the ability for this to move from a natural polyesters to these um, uh, what are essentially semi-aromatic uh, PET polyesters. Um, uh, we also more recently have discovered that actually some of these mutations affect the stability of the enzyme and actually make a rather surprising difference to the TM of, of, of these enzymes too. Um, and others have done a, a lot more studies in mutagenesis around this area, and we're starting now to start to unpick some of the rules of, of why this binds so, so well to, to PET. Um, this, this was one of the experiments we tried, which is a very obvious one. This is the, the polyethylene terephthalate chain in yellow. And here is the, the, the catalytic triad here with the, this activated serine here and the histidine. And uh, what we thought, well, if we change that PE, petase, you know, a plastic eating enzyme back to the cutin eating enzyme, we will be able to kind of prove the evolution going backwards. So that's what we did. We, we made the mutations to turn this basically into cutinase. And of course, what happened is rather than losing plastic eating activity or plastic digesting eating, plastic digesting activity, I should say, um, we made it better. I mean, not by much, by about 20%, but, you know, certainly reproducibly better. And when we modeled this into the active site, we could see that the PET chain fits deeper into the cavity. There's extra hydrophobic interactions and uh, the geometry and distances around the active site bonds are actually more productive or, or actually in, in a more productive orientation. So we think that's actually why it's better. But, uh, you know, um, this is how we had this headline of, you know, scientists accidentally uh, engineer enzymes. Um, of course, we didn't accidentally do it. Um, we did think quite hard when writing the paper, should we be honest and say we, we engineered this to be better? Or should we say we tried to make it a cutinase and got it completely wrong? So we went with the, the honest, honest one. And uh, actually, that was interesting because the honest story is the one that the media really picked up. So here is the control. This is a SEM of a plastic bottle. And um, what we're looking at here is uh, the surface of, of the plastic bottle. Um, you see, it's a little bit rough, but generally quite smooth. Um, when we add um, the natural petase enzyme, incubate for a few days, you start to see what's happening here. It's starting to munch away at the surface and it's liberating terephthalic acid and ethylene glycol into solution. And when we compare that to the, our, our variant, where we made two amino acid changes to try and turn it back into cutinase, uh, you can see here, um, you know, this is qualitatively, but um, it is actually working faster. And if we, we do the biochemistry, we can see that that is the case. So our paper, um, we published it in PNAS in 2018, and it, it went a bit nuts um, because it came out, you know, fortuitously at the same time as David Attenborough's Blue Planet 2. And... Uh, and of course, there's a lot of public awareness about the plastic pollution problem and, you know, solutions. So we, we spent most of our time saying that this is not a solution. It's a tiny part of the solution. Um, and, uh, and that's still the case, actually. Um, we need to be quite careful of messaging here. Um, our, our next paper um, went out to an even larger audience, um, to two and a half billion. I mean, that starts to become a reasonable percentage of of the planet's population, which is absolutely astounding and totally surprising. We almost didn't even write a story for this to put out because I didn't think it would get picked up. But actually, it's incredibly to think how interested people are in this field. And I think this is a good thing. Um, I should also point out that both those papers had 20 or 21 authors on them from at least three or four different institutes. 
So while Portsmouth led the enzyme engineering, um, it actually needed an awful lot of different expertise um, to make this work. This is Greg Beckham's group here, um, who was uh, the, the, um, the co-lead in both of those studies. So we worked very closely together. And here's the team at the Diamond Light Source, which of course we couldn't do without. Um, after I took this photo, I realized we're using plastic cups, which wasn't a great, great idea. Anyway, um, so this, this helped us. Um, and just like uh, Gary's center, um, the hub at, uh, you know, the HBB, um, we were able to fund um, the Center for Enzyme Innovation. And essentially, we used that money um, to hire about uh, a dozen researchers from all around the world and bring them together with the current researchers, which has been absolutely fantastic. We got five senior research fellows and six uh, senior research associates, technicians, and, and this, this has just been great. We also hired an innovation fellow to hopefully help us cross that, that divide between um, uh, translation level one and, and the rest of the world uh, to get these things out into industry. So this has been great. And the team here is a whole mixture of from professors down to PhD students. And it really is a great team to work in. Unfortunately, we hired all these people and then we had to from all over the world. And then we put them in flats in South Sea and locked them in over COVID lockdown, which was a bit unfortunate. We also opened our laboratories with all our shiny new instruments for about a month, and then had to switch them off and cover them in dust sheets and go home, which actually did make me cry a little bit, I'm not going to lie. But actually now we're, we're back up and running, which is great. Um, and this is, this is our plan. This, this was actually um, a figure from, from the grant application. And it's one that we've kind of stuck by because it really does help to describe what we do at the center. So, Discovery, I mentioned going out into the field. Uh, this is a big part of what we do, you know, scanning rubbish dumps and places in nature, particularly extreme environments. That's something we're, we're coming into quite a lot at the moment. But also there's this massive uh, wealth of databases that we can, um, I was almost going to say plunder, but look through and, and pull out, you know, these, these sequences that um, are of potential interest. And, you know, as I showed, we, we clone, uh, express and characterize these enzymes in great detail. Um, also how they're expressed and they're controlled as well. And then try to make lots of them. Um, so we have our, our fermentation team who help us out. Um, and then, you know, this was something that um, oh, it happened in the first year, really, when we went out to recycling industries and said, look, we've got these enzymes. And I remember one um, uh, recycling industry that I won't mention said, uh, Yes, that well, we saw your story on the news and um, the first thing we did was a risk analysis uh, of our business model, um, but we think luckily you're too far down the TRL scale to, to impact at this stage, which wasn't exactly what I was hoping for actually. Um, and you know, and it, you know, you have to be realistic about these things. There's billions being spent in the infrastructure and current recycling technologies. Um, and the, the, there's a very long supply chain with tight margins in between. So to come up with something quite disruptive, um, we need to think really hard about this. And what was key here is um, uh, those companies don't want enzymes. They want um, a process, an integratable process. And that's what we started working on here in this green box. So on the one half, we're making enzymes, but we don't want those enzymes to work well in the laboratory. We want them to work well in industry. So what we're doing now is we were very fortunate. We got another million pounds from a Solent Local Enterprise Partnership to build a lab, which is currently being built now, which uh, will allow us to have a biorecycling laboratory to take real waste plastics and break them down into these monomers that we can purify but then also a chemistry uh, area where we can repolymerize those into plastics and go around the circle over and over again. And then we can start to look at the life cycle and the, the economics of the system, trying to actually make a process that then we can deliver. So this, this of course, is uh, working very closely with the industry. But you know the, the, the principle is very straightforward. We would take plastic waste, in this case, for example, um, uh, plastic bottles or, or PET textiles, um, we'd add enzymes and break them down to their building blocks, these constituent monomers. We then separate them. And actually, that's pretty straightforward in this case. Um, you know, we, we currently do it from oil at the moment. So we have incredible resources um, in the oil companies that can help us to do this kind of thing at scale. And they're looking for new opportunities in this space, too. We then can either make new polymer chains um, to produce sort of, uh, high quality food grade plastic. Um, but uh, also we can add other bio-based monomers, for example, in making 
uh, higher value materials. And I think that's a very exciting space to be in. Um, the enzymes here, petes and emhetes. Um, I showed you the, the petes story, but the emhetes story was the one we tackled next, which takes these, so petes works at the surface. Ah, yes, okay. Um, so petes works at the surface. This, so we have this interfacial interaction of an enzyme and a, and a solid surface, which is a bit of a nightmare for those who, who, who like soluble Michaela's mentin kinetics. That doesn't really work here, which, uh, so we can throw that out the window straight away. But um, yes, so this is a little bit tough, but we can do lots of interesting mass balance type experiments to, to follow these reactions. But PETES produces this um, molecule here, MHET, which is basically the terephthalic acid with the ethylene glycol still attached. Um, and the MHETES enzyme further breaks that down into the two um, final building blocks, terephthalic acid and ethylene glycol. And these are both produced by the IDNL acyciensis enzyme. And if we solve the structure of the MHETES, um, and what is interesting is the core domain between PETES and MHETES um, here, shown in, in grey and blue, is pretty much the same. The MHETES is about twice the size and it forms this very large lid-like structure that uh, covers over the active site and presumably helps the catalysis. So this was a fun experiment to do. I like this experiment. So basically along here, we're adding increasing amounts of um, PETES and it, down here, increasing amounts of emhetes. And at here, zero, zero, we've got no breakdown. Basically, we put in little plastic coupons and add the enzyme mix. And as we get bluer and bluer, um, that's where the um, reaction's taking place. So you can add lots and lots of petes on its own, but you only get to this point here. As soon as you add a small amount of emhetes, you have this massive synergistic reaction. And we think that's due to product inhibition and pulling away that emhet um, and breaking it down. And actually um, at this ratio here, which is two to two mass, which is two to one molar because um, MHETES is, is uh, larger. Um, that's the perfect synergistic uh, mixture of the cocktail. So we thought, oh, this is interesting. Um, wonder what happens if we actually link them physically together instead of just a cocktail. So we made these little um, linker molecules. And first of all, we tried PETES linked to MHETES and that didn't work and we almost gave up. But you know, credit to our PhD student who said, let's try it the other way around. And that worked really well. And this indeed is much faster than the, the enzyme alone. Um, and you can see that here we've got MHETES doesn't do anything. PETES does it a bit. The combination is pretty good, but the, the, the um, chimeric enzymes are better again. So I think this is quite exciting. And we can see that in the biochemistry as well here. So we get this large increase with these uh, chimeric enzymes here compared to the mixture, which I'm showing here. Okay, so just for the last couple of minutes, can we go faster still? Um, yes, we can. And, and we've got about 100 enzymes at the moment that we're working on in the lab that are from places like uh, Montana, uh, Yellowstone National Park and, and various hot springs and hot places around the world. Because if you can take PET up to around 70 degrees, you're hitting its class transition temperature and the plastic gets soft and much more um, adaptable uh, for enzyme attack. Um, but of course you need an enzyme that doesn't fall apart at that temperature. So that's what we're working on. And um, there's, there's lots of good stuff coming through there and hopefully in the next year or so we'll, we'll be uh, publishing a lot in that space. The other thing, uh, apart from a faster enzyme is making enzymes at scale. And this is a bit of a surprise because GSK, who are a lot just along the road in Wor Worthing, producing the world's penicillin, um, have their crack fermentation team there who said, yeah, we can help you. And they've been helping us for free um, as part of their corporate sustainability um, campaign to help us make enzymes at scale. So this, this would have taken us uh, many, many months in the lab, um, uh, lots of liters of bacteria. They can make this uh, in, um, in, in large volumes for us, uh, powdered petes enzymes that really help push it along. And actually this is quite interesting because if we can do this at scale, we can probably do it at even higher scale which is good. Okay, so to, to finish off here, this is currently what we're, we're doing. We're taking oil and gas, we're making monomers, distilling monomers, making single-use PET bottles, and then it's ending up in landfill or incineration. Part of the issue with this linear cycle is downcycling, because even if your plastic bottle ends up in a green bin, it's very rarely turned back into a plastic bottle. If it's mechanically recycled and melted, it starts to lose some of its mechanical properties. It starts to go a bit gray or a bit yellow. So it's generally used for textiles instead. 
These are very poorly recycled. And, you know, if they are, they're often turned into things like carpets, which are negative value in terms of recycling because they're so horrible to work with. So what you can see here, there's some recycling going on, but it's not circular. It's just over time, the value is going down and we're ending up in landfill or incineration anyway. So the idea here is very simply to then use enzymes instead to complete the circle. Um, go round in the circle here, um, generating monomers back into the system from our plastic waste, reducing our reliance on oil and gas, um, and re reducing landfill and hopefully leakage into the environment. We're just about to publish a paper next week. It should be out in the journal Jewel, which shows a comparison of the whole supply chain of PET going from oil and gas all the way through to, to uh, uh, virgin PET compared to the recycling with enzymes method. And what we can show at scale is actually that it can be cost comparative. And that's really quite exciting. Not only that, the energy savings are up to 80% and the greenhouse gas emissions reductions are up to about 40%. So um, I think this is exciting. And this is the type of numbers that those CEOs of those companies need um, in order for them to uptake this technology. We also think enzymes can be really useful for mixed waste. Um, so what next? Well, we're on number one here, typical scientists start at number one, but actually number two, number three, um, polyethylene, PVC, um, et cetera, number five, polypropylene are going to be tough, as I said. There are hints out there in the literature that there are enzymes in organisms that can break these things down, but we're probably going to need a mixed um, process of pretreatment, a bit like lignocellulose. Again, there comes the parallels of moving these uh, technologies together and integrating them. We're doing that. We just joined um, a consortium called the Bottle Consortium, bottle.org, where actually we've got all these national labs and universities together working hand in hand. And I think this is a really exciting space to be in. There's a few European consortia as well. And I think um, going interdisciplinary is really the way forward. The idea being is that there's lots of different wastes, there's lots of different deconstruction methods, but the principle is the same. We're taking these back to monomers that can either be recycled or upcycled into higher value. So I'd like to, to leave it there. I think um, I've covered all these. The, I, the main idea is to incentivize recycling in the first place um, and then try and get this adopted um, and really trying to be interdisciplinary at the same time. As, as indeed the HBBE is too. Um, so I'm just a spokesperson for lots and lots of people in different teams around the world. Um, so thank you to all the people involved here, um, but also thank you very much for tuning in and listening to this talk. So I'll try and stop sharing my screen. Okay. Thank you very much, Sean. That was excellent. Really enjoyed that, really did. Okay, I've got quite a few questions on the chat. Um, I've got a few myself, but I'll not be selfish. I'll, uh, I'll take them off the chat first. Um, yes, one, one question was, why are pet hazers so robust? You talked about leaving them just on the bench overnight, what have you, in the, and they, they seem to be still fine. Any, any reason for that, you think, or just by chance? I think, well, you know, so these are secreted enzymes. They're secreted into the yeah. environment. And uh, when we look at cellulases, um, yeah. they're, they're kind of similar. Um, if Apart from cellulases tend to be covered in sugars that kind of protect them uh, as well. We don't really see that so much with, with these bacteria. Yeah. Um, but uh, yes, I think it's just because they've evolved to be secreted. And yeah. um, of course, biotechnology was never their idea when they evolved yeah, yeah. those enzymes. But for us, that's an incredibly useful property. The trouble is with those Idianella enzymes is they fall apart, you know, 40 plus degrees. So they're not going to be industrially useful. So that's why we're really concentrating on enzymes with slightly different scaffolds that can operate maybe at 70 degrees. Okay, okay. Yes, and um, are there any... Uh, obviously, with polysaccharide degrading enzymes, they often have carbohydrate binding modules. Have you? Is there any sign of those in plastic degrading enzymes? Because similar, you know, you mentioned the how similar they are in lignocellulose and plastic, etc. Any any signs of anything like that? My IP people will probably kill me, but <laughs> yes, we just Sorry. we just found one. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. And actually, you know, to, to we you know, other groups are doing this too, looking at this. Um, we, we're, we're basically taking a whole bunch of different binding modules and attaching them to see what happens. It's a great PhD type of uh, yeah. experiment because it involves really careful analytics. Um, we, you know, this is one thing I should mention actually in terms of doing all these types of experiments is we need to be quite careful with how, how we actually do them. There's yeah. a lot of uh, difficulties, I would say, in the lignocellulous field of comparing enzymes across labs because the substrates used were very different. Slight yeah. differences in pretreatment mean that you're actually dealing with a different starting material. Yeah. So I think um, one of the things we're advocating is really standardizing the plastics um, so that we can compare between labs. Yeah. On the one hand, we want to use real plastic waste, but actually when we're comparing like the difference between a, a domain and then a binding domain and multiple binding domains and chimeric enzymes, we kind of need to use a really standardized plastic. So we're kind yeah. of using Goodfellows PET with batch number XYZ yeah. so that we can always do that reproducibly. But but yes, uh, I think um, there's lots of parallels in terms of binding domains and things to the cellulose field. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, sort of linked to that question, the work you did with PETES and MHETES, tethering them together, why do you think that make a difference rather than just them working independently but not tethered? Why would that give you that extra activity to do? So I'm going to give you the truthful answer. Um, <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, one can sort of speculate that uh, you, there is a proximity event, you know, happening yeah. you, that, you know, you could imagine the, the product released from one, um, you know, by there's less yeah. diffusion to happen before the next enzyme can take that, that product yeah. uh, as a substrate for itself and move to the next one. Or it could be that we're actually um, by... We, we know PETES binds to the surface of the plastic, for example, um, MHETES not so much. So maybe mm -hmm. just pulling it in, in uh, close um, uh, attachment, you know, uh, yeah. is something. And again, we're, it's interesting. We're kind of missing a couple of techniques there. We can get high resolution crystal structures of the, these, you know, enzymes. We can get sort of really nice AFM or SEM of the yeah. plastic surfaces. But I think the bit that we're really missing and will be massively informative is how enzymes bind to the surface. That mm -hmm. sort of solid liquid interface. Um, yeah. Though that's quite difficult to probe, actually. So yeah. anyone with any good ideas there, uh, please get in touch. Yeah. There's, a, there's actually a guy called William Willits at uh, uh, Newcastle University who has a technique called molecular probes. He's very much looking at sort of like the cellulose type probes where you add your enzyme, then you wash your enzyme off, and then you have antibodies that will bind to various um, antigens and you'll see you see essentially what effect the enzyme has had. I wonder if that could be sort of translated into the into the plastic field as well. I'm sure it could because the, yeah. the system is quite robust you know yeah. the substrates are, are pretty easy to make and as I say the enzymes are stable um, so yeah yeah, yeah I'd love, love to get in touch. Yeah Yeah. okay um, yes the, the gribble is really interesting isn't it I think it's it's um, there was something similar, I think some of the work down at York University were looking at a, an LPMO type enzyme that they found in this type of creature. And that's, that's the, right. We yeah. worked very closely with uh, Simon right. Rapine Mason and Neil Bristol's yeah. team. Yeah. 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 And and I know at first everybody assumed that it's bacteria in the gut, and then suddenly it was a sterile gut and and the organism and the and, and the microbe it, 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 the organism had produced it. Why do you think it's so difficult to express? I know this is a nearly impossible question to answer, but why, why is it so difficult to express? You know, I think you said you found a particular fungus that um, could could express it well. Is it that is that just the high salt concentrations that it's naturally? I, I don't I don't really know. I mean, we did do some comparisons where we lined up lots of sequences, and you know what what we tended to do um, is just do a codon optimization. Um, actually, I think what we were doing is more like codon randomization. I, don't yeah. know, I think it wasn't actually as scientific as we thought it was. And what you can see is there's, um, if you look along the sequence uh, uh, and the RNA, messenger RNA, there's clearly pause sites there that probably help folding that we're probably destroying uh, by, right. by changing the sequence. But that's quite a tough field. It's not, yeah. it's not, there's not really good rules down there. Yeah. Um, I think there's could be progress there. That could be one reason you got this kind of pausing before yeah, one bit yeah. folds and another bit folds, yeah. because again, they're pretty stable enzymes. So maybe they need to fold in a, a kind of very ordered sequential yeah. manner. But again, yeah, we're not sure. Um, but uh, that, that was a painful process by, by yeah. us at Portsmouth and the York group as well, spending yeah. a lot of time trying to produce proteins that are unstable. Yeah. 
Oh, it's, it's tough. It is tough. Um, yes, I had a, a question about the work that your colleague Simon had done with with the mangroves. Have you have you the, you know have you looked at using a metagenomic approach because they seem to be degrading that material? Or there was there's certainly um, some some evidence that that was happening. Presumably, you're sort of looking at what organisms are there, what enzymes are being produced, and is that been successful, fruitful at all? We're, we're kind of just starting on this. Right. There's some other okay. groups in Europe that are a little bit further ahead. Um, and what they're seeing is really interesting, actually. I saw a talk recently where they're looking at that. And um, when they start culturing to pure cultures, you start losing activity sometimes. Yeah. And wow. I think what we're actually looking at here is consortia of bacteria that are producing multiple enzymes, which of course is a bit of a nightmare yeah. um, to, to work with. So, so I think modern metagenomics um, is going to be really super important. I 100% yeah. agree with that. Um, yeah, 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 for sure. And another question I'm asking a lot here, but um, the cutaneas and the petes are, were very similar, as you showed, actually remarkably similar. But we're not seeing a lot of petases in nature. Or my understanding is, even though there's only a few mutations to be had that will produce a, there just seem to be a bit of a disconnect for me there. Do you, do you think that's right, or is it am I just missing? So we, we're well. When we started looking hard, actually, we do actually see activity. It's not very high activity, um, yeah. but uh, yeah, it, it does exist out there in many other enzymes. Um, uh, some are just starting to be reported now. Yeah. So I think we'll see many more, actually. Um, I think the problem is these enzymes are kind of evolved to, to eat sort of these natural polyesters. And this kind of long part of the problem with PET, of course, is that often it's highly crystalline in nature. So it's, it's yeah. a really tough substrate. It's, it's, it's exactly the same cellulose problem mm -hmm. all over again. Mm -hmm. um, so I think when we start looking at substrates where we combine pretreatment, then we'll probably see some of those enzymes are much more active and, and maybe that's how we should be searching for them. Okay. 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 I should probably draw this to, to an end. Uh, amazing that you've had a paper with 2.4 billion views that's it's just <laughs> that's, that's really it's silly. unreal yeah. <laughs> that is yeah. fantastic um and great to hear your stories about getting all your nice, nice shiny new bits of kit in uh, uh, a week before uh, covid struck because we actually had a story where the day before we were all sent home our brand new mass spec arrived and we were oh. worried that it wasn't going to be delivered on that day and where would it end up being for the next three or four months or so. So yeah, it, it has been difficult setting these um, centers up in, in COVID, but the good thing is we're starting starting up again now, I think in getting back to full capacity. So brilliant, thank, thank you very much for the talk, John. Really, thank really you, good. Gary. Hopefully you can um, stay on and, and listen to some of the other talks to, uh, yeah, today. Yeah, so I'm looking be... forward to the talks actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, thank, thank you for all the questions as well. They're great. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and there might be some in the chat, John, there that I didn't ask. Um, Obviously, if, 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 if you want to answer them at some stage, please just, just let us know. So I'll just go back to the, to the schedule now. So we have um, lunch now between 12.30 and 1.15. But just to remind people that the research poster session is on as well um, at that time. So it would be great if people could, to, could pop into that Miro board as well. So great. Thanks, thanks everybody. And we'll see you all again shortly. Thank you.